Bom dia para quem é de bom dia, boa noite para quem é da boa noite, boa tarde, se você acabou de receber uma notificação no YouTube para vir assistir mais um Bate-Papo Meio, hein? e hoje eu estou muito nervoso porque a gente vai entrevistar o ídolo, cara, o cara que a gente conhece há décadas. Só que a entrevista é em inglês, então você precisa primeiro ligar aqui subtitles, né, legendas, e depois colocar translate to Portuguese. E aí você vai ver as legendas aqui embaixo. And now we are speaking English and I am really, really nervous because, uh, as I said, we are interviewing the uh, our big rock star today. And I am with Rogério Betoni that are bringing this, his book here. How are you, Rogério? I'm doing good. What about you? Thank you for receiving uh, us. I am so happy I received this book. The first one, the Austin Spare book, and it is the most beautiful book I had this year. And the quality is superb. And you are now doing a crowdfunding to bring us the works of our guest tonight. So would you introduce him? Yeah, of course. Uh, we are we launched this campaign in Catarzi platform, platform to release the whole work of Phil Heim. And he's here today. He's one of the most important and well-known writers in English, in, in English language of occultism, shamanism, chaos magic, and other things. And we're going to publish his four books, plus a book he, a collection of essays he made just for us in Brazil. And as a plus, we have probably his three Uh, books about shamanism, urban shamanism. He's finishing it. And then this is the whole campaign. Uh, if you're interested, please visit the link. And that's it. So, okay, thank, thank you, you very much. so much to be in our program, Phil. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's very cold in London today. Brazil's hot. <laughs> We are really, really hot. And well, the first question that we usually ask our guests is about the true will and the, the personal journey. So to introduce you to the Brazilian audience, we'd like to know how was your journey? And how did you start? Well, <coughs> excuse me. That's a, a long story, really. Uh, going back to when I was in my teens. Uh, to be honest, I thought magic was rubbish when I was you know, 16 or 17, I, I didn't, I thought it was all complete nonsense. Um, but round about that age, I started to study psychology at school. Um, one of the first psychologists I started to read was Austin, Austin uh, sorry, was uh, Carl Jung. So I started to read a lot of uh, Jungian ideas. And one day I was sitting in the library at school And uh, I was looking through a magazine on witchcraft, but I wasn't actually interested in the articles. What I was looking for was naked pictures of witches, which I think is, you know, the sort of thing you do when you're 17 and at school and a bit strange, you know. And uh, whilst I was looking through, hoping to find some, some pictures of naked people dancing around in a circle, uh, I came across a picture by Austin Austin Spare. Uh, I don't remember what the picture was, but it sort of resonated with me, if you like. Um, it seemed to make sense in terms of uh, the, the book on Jung I'd been reading. I think it might have been Memories, Dreams and Reflections. And um, I thought, oh, maybe there's something to all this occult stuff after all. You know, maybe there's, maybe there's something in it. So I, I, I went to my local library And, and I read everything, anything I could get my hands on. So lots of, uh, lots of uh, supernatural novels like Danny Sweetley, um, spiritualist material, theosophical texts, you, just anything I could. And there wasn't a great choice. Um, and from that, it sort of got me interested and I sort of snowballed from there. And by the time I was 18, just before I, I left to go to my first degree course, I'd already tried out a few uh, meditations and spells and things. Uh, and everything just kind of like um, snowballed on from there, if you like. 
Uh, when, I, when I went away from home, I went up to a, a place up in the north of England to do a degree in psychology, and I met some actual occult, you know, occult practitioners while I, whilst I was doing my degree, and uh, fell in with various um, various groups of uh, occult practitioners, if you like, and, and the whole thing really went on from there. So I kind of fell into occultism, you know, rather than feeling I had a, an impulse to uh, become spiritual or anything. I just, it just, I don't know, it became a habit, really, that I just carried on with for the rest of my life. Yeah, and uh, uh, it all became with Austin Osmond Spear. Yeah, Austin Osmond yeah. Spear sort of like lit the, lit the fuse, mm -hmm. if you like. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it was years later that I actually bother to read some of his material and I thought, oh, this is really interesting. I don't understand any of it, but it's really interesting. And again, I just looked at the pictures a lot, you know. Hmm. How was to, to study magic at that time? Because our, our listeners here today, they have internet and everything. And at that time, we didn't even have uh, iPhones or anything like that. No, you have nothing to go like to that. Books and, and how was it to, to, to get books and to talk to people about well, magic? I've, I've been thinking about that recently, actually. It's, it's kind of weird trying to explain that to people now. But in Britain at that time, if you didn't live in London, where, you know, everything happens, uh, there was a, probably about three or four occult bookshops across the entirety of the country. You couldn't walk into an ordinary bookshop and buy an occult book. There just wasn't that many. Um, it was very difficult, if you like, to penetrate into the occult scene as it as it actually was. And um, what happened with me was um, I joined a Theosophical Society because I'd read a lot of Theosophical material, like you know Madame Blavatsky's Secret Doctrine, and I thought, wow, if this is what they're on about in 1895, what are they going to be on about now? Actually, what I did find out was that they were still on about the stuff that had been written in 1895. They hadn't really kind of progressed. Um, but I was at a Theosophical Society meeting and I met this, this guy and he, he stood out because apart from me, he was the only other person in the room under about 50. You know, I was there. The rest of them were kind of like old geezers in their 60s. And, and then this guy turned up. Uh, I got talking and it turned out he was doing some, he was an academic and he was doing some kind of research project on theosophy. And he said to me, oh, do you know about the Sorcerer's Apprentice? Now, this was in Leeds and it turned out the, the Sorcerer's Apprentice was this actual occult bookshop that you could go and visit. It was only open to the public one day a week, but it was still, you know, a proper occult bookshop actually run by occultists. Woo. So I, I went to the address and it was this like totally blacked out shop. It was like a, going to a sex shop. It looked really sleazy. And I kind of tapped on the door nervously and this little like slit opened and it's like, yes, you got one. And uh, I got into this, you know, proper occult bookshop and it was just crammed full of, you know, candles and bizarre statues and books on all the shelves. Um, and that was my first real opener into the proper world of the occult because one thing that this shop sold, apart from books, was occult magazines. And in those days, you know, before the internet, before mobile phones, before Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff, the way that people um, communicated ideas to each other was through magazines. You know, these little kind of like bits of paper stapled together. And there were, there were a kind of range of magazines that were like magazines for witches and magazines for thalamites and uh, magazines for just people into a, a whole medley of stuff. Um, and it was through leafing through these magazines, I found like contact adverts, you know, like the things you find in the back of magazines. And like, oh, I, you know, uh, I don't know, couple into, into lingerie and threesomes, one third person kind of thing. But it was the kind of the occult version. Um, I was back living in my hometown at the time and I was leafing through one of these magazines and I found this, this advert for a coven, a witch coven in Blackpool, which is where I was from and where I was back living. And they'd given a phone number. So I was like, well, you know, 
Okay, to be honest, I wasn't looking for um, to join a witch coven. You know, if it had been up to me, I would have thought of, okay, you know, hardcore ritual magicians or dodgy Satanists or something like that. But this was the first actual contact I'd made with a real, if like, occult group. So I rang this number and this, this woman answered and she seemed very nice. And she invited me to uh, go around and meet them. And I met this kind of really weird bunch of people that was a witch coven in my own hometown that had been, you know, going on without my knowledge. Um, and I got initiated, that was the first witchcraft group I got initiated into. So, you know, that was my passage into the occult. Finding about this, this little bookshop in Leeds, kind of like tucked away in a, in a back street, um, picking up an occult magazine and, you know, kind of stealing myself to, to ring a phone number and, and go and meet some totally unknown people. Well, I have the, the second question is based on, uh, uh, I structure it in, based on your journey and a unique point of view, what's magic to you? But I will divide it into two questions. Uh, what was magic to you back then? And what, um, what do you think magic is now? Uh, that's, that's a very good question. Um, I don't think I had a clear idea of what magic was back then. It was all the same thing to me, whether it be astrology or Zen or anything in between, you know, uh, Lost Cities of Atlantis, Sea Monsters, whatever, H.P. Uh, Lovecraft's, you know, Call of Cthulhu, it was all one kind of like continuum. And I didn't really kind of like start to understand that there were different genres that, you know, if you were a witch, you had different beliefs to say, if you're a ritual magician, that pagans didn't get on with Thelemites very much at the time, you know, that all took time for me to work out. Um, and I think perhaps the one thing that stayed with me about magic is um, it's a way of making sense of the world. That's one thing. Um, it's a way of dealing with the world's, um, if you like, you know, the, the stuff that life throws at you. And it's a way of, of feeling like you have some agency, you have some degree of control over what's, what's going on in your life and, uh, and around the world and in the world around you. You know, it's a way of saying like, I, you know, I can kind of like steer myself through life uh, I'm not just somebody being blown around on the winds of fortune, you know. I'm not a victim. Uh, and I think that's the central thing that's, that's stayed with me throughout my, if you like, um, exploration through the world of the occult. That's amazing. Uh, thank, thank you for that. And so finally, Brazilians will have the opportunity to know not only one of your books, but all of them at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, could you please tell us a little more about each one of those books and their history? Okay, right. Yeah. Well, the first book that got published by uh, New Falcon, as it was then, it's now Original Falcon, I'm not going to go into that, um, was Condensed Chaos. Now, back in about, I think, 92, I'd done a short like booklet, you know, just like a little thing called Condensed Chaos. Um, what prompted me to write that was I'd, I'd read a book by an American guy that was like, I think it was called An Introduction to Chaos Magic, and he called it English Thelema. And I just thought, this is rubbish, you know, even I can do better than this. So I wrote this little thing, Condensed Chaos. Um, and I did another little thing on Chaos Servitors. Um, and I, you know, I was selling them myself through mail order. Um, and then in about, I think it was 94, um, a guy called Bob Williams, he's, he's dead now, he, he was the section head of the, of the Illuminates of Thanatros, you know, the IOT in America. And he, he was kind of like taking these two little booklets I'd written and showing them to various publishers and trying to get them interested. And uh, Bob sent me an email and said, oh, uh, Falcon are interested, but they want a manuscript really quickly. And I was kind of like, OK, what do they want? And he said, well, if you could, you know, get another 60,000 words together, that would be great. And I said, OK, how long have I got? And he went, oh, you've got about four months. And I was like, shit. Yeah. So I, I 
it was kind of fortunate because I'd, I'd written a lot. I've been writing for magazines since I think the early 80s. So I just kind of like went through all my old stuff, published and unpublished. And I've been doing some workshops on Chaos Magic, I think, in London at the time. And I just threw everything I could think of into, into that book. Um, so I, you know, I took the contents of the original two booklets, threw out some stuff that I thought was shit, and I just stuffed everything I could think of into it. Um, and that was condensed chaos. And I think I think it shows really. It's it's very much a kind of like oh a mishmash of a lot of things, you know. But yeah. people seem to like it, so that's cool. So uh, that was the first book that uh, Falcon brought out. Now the second book was Prime Chaos, and in fact, Prime Chaos was the first book I, I wrote. Just to confuse everybody, um, it's uh, I start I started writing that in the probably in the mid eighties. And it evolved into a through a series of mostly rejection letters from publishers who weren't interested. Uh, and eventually, I, I, when I was in London, I think in ninety two or ninety three, uh, I brought out the first kind of paperback edition of Prime Chaos. Some of it was well received, uh, and some of it people really didn't like. So the parts that people didn't like got dropped from the the Falcon edition. Um, that's a much more considered work. Um, there's a lot of stuff on group dynamics in it because I, I was really into the idea of um, doing magic in groups with other people. Uh, and I'd been trained to run groups when I did my degree in occupational therapy. I was you know, trained to uh, look at group dynamics and, and set up groups and, and train people in groups, mostly psychiatric patients, but a lot of that stuff is kind of like, transferable into a magical setting, you know. Um, so Prime Chaos is, is a lot, quite a bit different to Condensed Chaos. There's not as much, there's not, it doesn't go all over the place. And, you know, there's a whole, there's a big section on ritual on, on my thoughts on, on how to do dramatic ritual in various ways. Um, there's a big section, as I say, on, on groups. Um, there's a little bit of stuff on um, Discordian magic and a little bit of stuff on Cthulhu magic. Um, but yeah, that book is is a kind of like quite a different beast to uh, to Condensed Chaos. It's it's more you know ponderous. Uh, it's been described as by other people. Um, and then the other two books, I mean, do, do you want me to talk about the pseudonymic and in that question about the Cthulhu mythos or do it yes, now? Yes, 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 you can jump uh, uh, to the nomicon and then we... Okay, let's, let's shell the pseudonymicon. So let's come on to um, Heinz Varieties. Yeah. Um, Heinz, for, well, I've been, I think in t by 2019, I'd worked out that I'd been writing stuff about magic for 40 years. So I thought, you know, this is a good point to do maybe an anthology, uh, not necessarily about of my best work, but my favourite work. And I thought, well, what would perhaps make that project more interesting is if I threw in some autobiographical uh, reflections, if you like, about, you know, how I got onto different paths and where my thought has changed over the years about those things. So like, you know, what I started out thinking about chaos magic and what I think about it now. Um, and then for each, so I selected a number of pieces, you know, in various genres, if you like, like fiction. Um, I'm not great at writing fiction. It's not my meteor, if you like, but I, you know, I've, I've had my moments. So I did fiction, practices, tantra, sexuality, chaos magic, other stuff. And what I tried to do was pick five pieces that I thought showed how my ideas changed across a like, you know, like a 20, 30 year time span. And also to kind of like contextualize those pieces. So to say, okay, you know, this piece is about this, but this is what was going through my head when I wrote it. This was it's what's going on in my life, just to give the reader a kind of like a back a sense of a background context to why I wrote a thing. And then to kind of like, you know, to give an introduction to how my ideas have changed according to specific genres. You know, what yeah. what do I think is important about magical fiction? Why do yeah. I think it's important to write about sexuality? Stuff like that. 
Yeah, so how many varieties of, of the, um, my partner Maria, she's an artist. Uh, she designed the cover and the internal artwork, which I think is is wonderful and really complements my words. And um, an old friend of mine, David Southwell, who's a very um, well published author, fantastic guy. He wrote the foreword, and uh, I, I really like it. I think it's a fantastic book. Yeah, I think it too. <laughs> you know, so. It's just it's different. Yeah. I'm kind of uh, making myself vulnerable through it, which I think is a good thing. Kind of exposing yeah. myself to my readers, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, I think this, the, I, I was talking about this uh, the other day because one of the things I consider very uh, uh, good in your personality and your work is the fact that you, you are very brave talking about yourself, exposing yourself, you don't have any problems mm. with that. And I think it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, Thank you. So uh, about trajectories, uh, the yep. book you prepared to be published here in Brazil, and what motivated you to organize it, and specifically for your readers, what the themes you do with it in the book? Well, you asked me. You know, I, you, you sent me an email and said, have you got anything else we can publish? And I was kind of like, mm, maybe, you know. Well, as it happened, um, I've been having some very interesting exchanges with people on Twitter. I don't do this often, but occasionally I get into these really, you know, intense conversations with people, and it's not just about posting pictures of cats or whatever. Yeah. Um, and that prompted me to do to to start writing some, you know, completely new material um, about magic, particularly about things that I think don't really get talked about, but I think are important, like how not to be an idiot on Twitter. You know, um, it, it really struck me that just as in, in the 80s and 90s, you know, there was lots of magic going on in groups, but actually not many people writing about the, the ins and outs of just being in a group and what that entails, you know, the, the skills that you develop to stop each other from going bananas and killing each other. And I think, you know, modern magicians, we spend an awful lot of our time, if we're not careful, on social media. But there's hardly anything written about how to be a magician on social media. So that was where the essay, don't be a dipshit, came from. And it's about, well, you know, if you're a magician, you have to accept that words have power. And on social media, all we have, unless we're doing this, of course, all we have is words. So, you know, I think it behooves us to be careful about how we use words to, to communicate with each other. So that's... That was one thing that I thought would be worth, you know, putting out to a wider audience. Um, and another thing was, you know, another of the essays in trajectories is about reading occult books. You know, we all, all occultists are like book crazy. You know, we have huge amounts of books, spend far too much money and time collecting books, reading books. But there's hardly anything about how we engage with books. You know, how do you decide, how do you decide what makes a good book and what makes a bad book, you know? How do you decide whether something that an author tells you is an occult truth or just something, you know, their voice and their opinion and say, oh, this is true for everybody because I've, you know, seen it on the astral plane or whatever, you know? But that's a, another interesting kind of like aspect of occult practice, which I think doesn't get talked about perhaps enough, you know? Um, so there's things like that. Um, I also thought it might be an idea to resurrect some old essays, which I'd written and <coughs> put out on the web in a PDF years ago, but I haven't had much traction. Um, and after that, I just kind of like looked through my fiction file and found a story that I, I wrote years ago that was you know, published in a magazine, but not really been seen since, um, and just threw them together. And that's trajectories. Now, as you know, you guys are getting that first. Um, I am in communication with Falcon at the moment to take in some of that material and putting it into, a, into an English edition with more material, but that won't happen until next year sometime. So you guys are getting you know, completely new, unpublished material from me. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, the, the rest of the world won't see for quite a while. Yeah, we are very honored to, to to have this material to publish first. <laughs> Thank you so much. 
This is a really, really great. Um, Phil, uh, if you think of your work as a whole, especially considering all the varieties that you, you wrote about, yeah. it's possible to see three main branches or aspects, uh, shamanism, mm -hmm. chaos magic, and tantrism. What kind of dialogue we can build between them? Um, that's a very interesting question. I mean, Shamanism is one of those words that you know was really in vogue in the in the eighties and nineties, and and now when people talk about shamanism, it's kind of like very easy to get caught up in issues like cultural appropriation, which is a valid thing, I think. So shamanism has become a bit of a a, a naughty word in some occult circles, you know. Um, what I was trying to do with my shamanic writing, if you like, was to say, okay. Mm, how can I put it? Magic, as I understood it in those days, was very much, you know, you either did it in groups or you did it as an individual. You know, you were pursuing a, a transcendental path up the tree of life or something like that. But it seemed to me that what was missing, particularly from a shamanic perspective, with shamanic and in inverted commas, if you like, was uh, actually working for other people. You know, trying to solve other other people's issues through magic, um, and what I was trying to kind of like push towards with with these with these three little booklets I did and, and various essays was say, well, look, you know, if you we you know we live in an urban culture, it's um, a, a lot of magic that was written at the time felt. To me to be kind of not really dealing with the, the issues of living in an urban culture you know like how do you cope with your life if you're extremely poor um yeah. you know how can magic help you not so much get rich but you know accommodate your life you know how do you deal with like modern issues like drug addiction or you know people getting beaten up in the streets because they're queer Thing. you know so I looked in the books of magic I had and there were not answers to questions like that so um one of the, I was not so much trying to provide solutions for those kind of uh issues but looks like this is the sort of thing we should be looking at you know how do how do communities heal themselves when there's been a major disaster you know um how do you connect with the the urban environment that you're living in uh, and these were things that, uh, you know, still interest me and uh, were very much on my mind because at the time um, I was extremely poor. Uh, I was living in a, in a dense urban environment. Most of the people I knew didn't have jobs. You know, they either kind of like got state benefits. I was on state benefit or they, they did things in a kind of like black economy, sort of cash only economy. Um, and most of the people I knew were really poor. And they they helped each other, you know. Uh, there were people you could go to for various things, and um, in a small way, I guess I became the person to go to if you had weird experiences. You know, if you if you thought there was a ghost in your cellar or something like that. Oh, go and see Phil Harry. He'll he'll have a go. He'll try and sort it out, or he'll run screaming out of your house. That happens too sometimes. Um, or maybe somebody wants a tarot reading because they've been arrested by the police and they want to know how the court case is coming out. So that was very much the context in which I was talking about shamanism. It wasn't kind of like, if you like, new age shamanism that's all woo and Native American wisdom and spirituality and crystals and all that stuff. It was very much, you know, this is why we called it urban shamanism, because it's about surviving as a magician and building yourself if you like a magical practice in an urban environment so that was that now what's interesting for me in hindsight is that when academics who've, who've kind of like you know looked at my work for developing some great thesis or other about contemporary cultism tend to talk about those, the, the three little booklets that are on shamanism, they count it as part of the chaos magic work, which I don't really agree with. But on the other hand, there is a kind of connection there. Because as I said earlier, I was trained as an occupational therapist. Now, 
a kind of a key point in 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 occupational therapy training is what they call um, a multi a multidisciplinary approach to problem solving, which means you have a client and you have a range of options for for you know treating their issue, whether it be a psychiatric problem or a, a physical health problem. And what you try and do, and this is particularly true of the psychiatric approach, is you choose if you like, um, a theory or a practice model that best addresses the client's circumstances. So some clients, you know, you might take a, a psychodynamic approach and put them into therapy for 60 years or whatever. Other clients, you might choose behavior therapy, which is you know, much more results focused and doesn't really bother with, you know, introspection and consciousness and all that stuff. It's not really important. So, but that kind of, approach that I trained to do as a therapist, I kind of transferred into my magical practice. So to give you an example, um, when I was doing my urban shaman bit, I had this, this client who came to me and she felt in need of a kind of a protective spell around the house. And I knew you know, loads of different ways of doing protective spells around people's houses. I could do a very quick one, but I thought, no, what is going to make you feel the most secure is something where you pull out all the stops. You know, you, you, you sort of like get up and I get dressed up in a big robe and I've got a massive kind of like staff and I go in there and incense and lots of waving my arms around and evoking archangels. And we did this really big kind of like together, we did this really big kind of like ritual with lots of da -da -da and, da -da -da and all that. And, you know, I, th I could have done a lot simpler one without lots of, drama but I thought no the drama will actually help her feel secure you know and what that is about for me is it's not what you want or really what you believe it's what will work for the client and that approach that if you like that multi no let's look at the situation and see what the situation the best approach for that situation is that approach was something that again influenced my chaos magic attitude um because I, you know, chaos magic was something that was, if you like, bubbling under at that time. You know, there was a lot of buzz about it. And what it did for me was, I thought, okay, this is, okay. The, one of the first things I encountered when I started, you know, coming across chaos magic stuff was these two guys and they'd done like a, an audio tape, a cassette tape, and it was a, a chaos path working. But it wasn't where you, you know, you go up the tree of life and encounter some god in a diaphanous gown and, you know, trees, trees and birds and flowers and all that. It was kind of like a science fiction thing. And you sat in this kind of like, kind of steampunk globe that had all kind of um, receptors on it and it sucked in aether from a black hole. And you wore a kind of like, you know, you visualize yourself wearing a kind of like space suit. And I thought, this is really cool. This is kind of like, you know, science fiction magic. And I, yeah. what came to be central for me with chaos magic was the idea that rather than sticking within the boundary of occultism, you know, the tree of life or the wheel of the earth or whatever, you can draw ideas from outside that occult boundary, that occult event horizon, if you like. Um, so I, I was, very, at the time I was, I was very into drama therapy. So I thought, okay, I'm going to take a lot of the stuff I'm, I'm learning as a drama therapist and just make it magical just by changing a word here and there. Um, I got really into improvisational theatre as well, and I brought a lot of that stuff in. So for me, chaos magic was, if you like, widening the horizons of what could be considered a cult. And this is still an issue which I think is a bit of a problem, that people who get into occultism, it's like they go down a cul-de-sac where they'll only read stuff that's occult, you know, and ignore a lot of stuff that's really interesting and exciting and could actually grow their practice because it's not in an occult book. And I think Chaos Magic was a way of kind of like broadening, for me, it was a way of broadening those horizons. Let's bring in some stuff from outside and outside the occult box, if you like, and see if it's useful for us. Um, and also the other thing about chaos magic I like was the idea that you could have a sense of humor and be a magician. 
that you could do silly things, you know, and that silly things would be just as effective as, you know, painstakingly following the procedure in a grimoire or, you know, doing the, the spell exactly as it says in the book. And I was thinking, oh, no, you know, let's be silly, let's be wacky. You know, somehow that's no less effective. I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, me and a mate of mine got really into the idea of sigils as flow charts. And this is something I talk about a bit in, in Condensed Chaos, because we were thinking, um, you know, let's, let's kind of like chart out um, a series of, of things that we want to unfold, unfold in somebody's life as a, as a kind of flow chart with options, you know, kind of computer modeling of, of a situation particularly a complex situation. Like, oh, let's try and get this thing to happen. And if that happens, then this could happen or that could happen or this could happen. Uh, we, we kind of like created this huge kind of like flow chart sigil. And then because we were lazy, you know, we didn't do any of that charging business. We just kind of like stuffed it behind a sofa and forgot about it. And then about six months later, you know, I was talking about this particular person we'd done the sigil for, and my mate said, oh, well, all that happened anyway. You know, and I thought, okay, well, we didn't bother charging it, so maybe you don't need to charge things, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> this is great. Uh, I have, a, there are the questions about Cthulhu and Lovecraft, and, and it's really important to me since, uh, um, I have been uh, written role-playing games here in Brazil oh, yeah. for over two decades. Uh -huh. And uh, your book, Pseudonomicon, is considered the, the best material ever written about Lovecraft and magic. Oh, thank and you. It's, it's much, my so favorite nice. book. Yeah. And how did you come up with the idea of writing about that? And what's your experience with this kind of magical practice? Okay, well, I am an avid role-playing gamer, as you might have guessed. Uh, I've been playing role-playing games since uh, the first ever D Dungeons and Dragons release in the in the late seventies, mm -hmm. and uh, in fact, I did my degree thesis on on role-playing games, and uh, I was very nearly the editor of a British role-playing game magazine, but I didn't get the job. So yeah, me and role-playing games have had a, a long association, and I've still got friends who are in the business. Um, but anyway, well, the Sedonomican. Um, I did my first Lovecraftian ritual, I think it would have been about 1980, something like that. Um, back in those days, as, as I said earlier, I didn't really make a distinction between different, if like, types of magic. It was all the same thing. Um, and I remember um, it was very fortunate because I, I got it. I was first into Clark Ashton Smith. I didn't know, I didn't know, have a clue who Lovecraft was, but I read lots of Clark Ashton Smith books and they kept seeing this guy on the back saying, oh, this book is brilliant, H.P. Lovecraft. And I thought, who's this H.P. Lovecraft guy? I have to read him. So of course I, I started reading Lovecraft and I was like, wow, you know. Um, and there were several kind of like Necronomicons knocking about. Uh, there was the Simon Necronomicon, so I got hold of a copy of that, big huge thing with silver inlaid all over it, very impressive looking. Um, there was a, a, a British Necronomicon that came out, and there was H.R. Geiger's Necronomicon. So I kind of like got all these different Necronomicons and started looking at them, you know. Um, and somewhere out of all that, I, I got this idea of trying to evoke Yogg-Soth off. Um, and at the time, I was I was living in a in a little village about five miles outside of this city where I was studying, and from the village you could you could go up and into like a, a local mountain range. So one night, I went up to that you know, this like kind of like low peak mountain and stood on the top and chalked sigils all over the the rocks that were on top of the mountain and stood there and tried to evoke Yogg-Sothoth. <laughs> Uh, you know, I scared myself shitless. Um, I, I kind of either hallucinated or saw like a, a beam of light coming out of the heavens, and I was like, "Ah, oh, fuck!" Yeah. And I, I have to make insanity I, checks. So I just like beam of light coming down the heavens, and I was like, "Fuck!" And I run away. I run off the mountain, and I, I turned up at a mate's house at about three o'clock in the morning, absolutely 
gibbering and he was like, I told you this would happen. I told you this would happen. You should do that sort of thing. Uh, and that was my first kind of like attempt to uh, do magic with Lovecraft's great old ones. Yeah, 1980 or so. Uh, but I persevered. And eventually when I moved to Leeds, which was a kind of like hotbed of occultism by the time I got there in the, in the mid eighties, and I met this bunch of people calling themselves the Esoteric Order of Dagon. Um, and they were people who, I think, possibly read too many Kenneth Grant books in one go, um, or were thelemites. And, and they were kind of, they had this little fanzine, you know, I can't remember the name of it. And um, they were writing articles about, oh, let's, let's stick the great old ones on the tree of life, or let's look at Jungian symbolism in this story. And I was kind of like, uh, boring, you know. I, I wanted to do rituals with the great old ones. I wanted to summon Yogg-Sothoth and not shit myself in the process. I wanted to, you know, talk to great Catholic and things like that. Um, and I, I joined the Esoteric Order of Dagon because why not? I was joining loads. I was involved in loads of different groups at that time. Um, and I actually edited a, a little anthology of their weeblings about Catholic and, and magic and so forth. Um, that was in about 1987, 88, something like that, possibly 89. Uh, and then a few years later, I was thinking to myself, well, do I want to reissue that work? You know, um, and I thought, no, I won't bollocks to that. I'll, I'll do something new. And I'd been approached by a, a publisher who was doing an anthology of kind of like Lovecraft inspired stories. And he, he was into magic and he wanted some magicians to put stuff in as well. So I wrote this piece, uh, Cthulhu Madness, which is I think probably one of the most popular things I've ever written. It turns up in anthologies all over the place. Uh, it's just been featured in, in a new anthology that uh, the Whitechapel Art Gallery have brought out this year, um, which is all about trying to convey that sense of what happens when you read too much Lovecraft and get into magic and start to go a bit bonkers from it all, you know, and you sort of see in getting the, in the way that Lovecraft's protagonists kind of like, you know, they go through a story and they put all these pieces together and eventually they start seeing the big picture. And at that point they start going a bit bonkers. You know, that's I think what could happen with Lovecraftian magic, if you're not careful. Which can be really good from a, if you like, from a magical point of view, so long as you don't end up bananas after it. But then that's always an issue with magic. There's this kind of like doing magic, whether it's Catholic magic or the Tree of Life or anything, can kind of push you into, let's say, liminal states of mind where you start to go off your rocker a bit. And it can be really magical and effective. But of course, the problem is you tend to go off your rocker and you might need you know, pulling out or taking a break. I do recommend taking a break from magical weirdness. You know, I've taken lots of breaks. Anyway, after I wrote Cthulhu Madness, that started me to rethink this whole idea of the Great Old Ones, that they're not so much deities in the way that we perceive, say, I don't know, Isis or Thor or... <coughs> whoever, you know, they're not beings. They're like experiences into which you slip. So I started thinking about Yogg-Sothoth as a sort of gateway drug, if you like, or Shubnigarath, not as some horrible thing that lives in the woods, but our fear of, of, of forests, our fear of the outside, you know. Um, so um, the pseudonomicon is not so much a kind of like how to do Lovecraftian magic, it's a, a kind of, if you like, a critique of magic seen through a Lovecraftian lens, if that makes sense. So, you know, one of the things I talk about in there is, well, you know, there's this thing in magic, oh, you always have to banish things that you've called up. Well, why? You know, that just seems pointless. OK, there are circumstances might you want to do that. But again, there are circumstances when you might not want to do that. You might want to keep the magic going and equally. You know, it's always seemed really bizarre to me that people go out into wild places like in the countryside and do magic, the sort of ritual that was really meant to be done indoors in a temple. You know, that 
in very environment seems to say we, we need a different kind of approach to magic. So what I was trying to do with this with the pseudonomicon was, you know, if you like, question some kind of like embedded thinking and say, well, let's let's take magic, you know, if we're gonna mess around with HP Lovecraft's ideas, let's take them in a different direction. Uh, that's again still something that interests me. Um, because I think to my shame, I never wrote anything about Lovecraft and racism. And I think that's a, a big issue that magicians still don't want to talk about is the, A, the racial elements in, in Lovecraft, and B, you know, the racist stuff that abounds in occultism and, and how we deal with that and how we confront it. So these are still issues that I, I think about now. You can write something about this. I'm sorry? Maybe you can write something about this. Yeah, yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah. I think it's a very interesting topic. Uh, and it has something to do with, the, with my last question. But before it, I'd like to know, so based on all, all the things you said today, what are your influences today at this moment? At this moment? Yeah. Um, well. I'm kind of busy with other things at the moment. Uh, there's a friend of mine doing a book on 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 yoginis, you know, the female spirits from the from the tantric um, philosophy, which uh, I'm kind of trying to do some edits for him. So that's a project. I've got another uh, tantra book project, which is a collection of translations of of early Kali tantras, which uh, a friend of mine has done, and that's something that's on the way. Um, I mean, you know, coming back to that question about the connections between shamanism and chaos magic and tantra, um, I've spent the last 20 odd years more or less doing tantric stuff and ignoring, you know, shamanism and chaos magic. But now I'm starting to see, yes, there is a kind of connection between, um, between those three things and the tantra. And I think I'm not quite, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm I kind of I'm starting to feel that yeah, I can make a tenuous connection between if you like those three phases. And, and it uh, going back to trajectories, that essay on wonder that's in trajectories, you know, this whole idea of you can do magic for wealth for, for material gain, or you can do it for transcendent results, but also you can do magic for to inculcate in yourself a sense of wonder, that's something that's very much come out of my tantric practice. Um, and, and there's, there's a lot of about in tantric philosophy about wonder as the ground state of being. So I think that's what's one of the things that I see as a connection. There are others, but you know, it's for me, it's a matter of, of waiting until things make sense enough to me that I can write them down, if that doesn't sound yeah. weird. You know, because yeah. I've done, I've, I've I come up with bizarre ideas all the time. And sometimes I just have to wait until, you know, they've gathered enough momentum on their own. It's kind of like, I, I put them on a, sh a mental shelf and just say, you stay there until, you know, until you want to start kind of like banging on the door and say, let me in. And a lot of my ideas, shaped like that they just take time and it's sometimes years or even decades and then suddenly i'll go oh that's interesting uh i was i was talking to a friend of mine about austin and austin spare sigils um because she'd done a workshop on on sigils and, she, and which i watched and she said well did you think it was really basic i said no it was really interesting because it made me think about this whole idea of of you know the magical intention for a sigil it, it gave me a new idea that I'd not really considered before, that when you create a sigil, what in effect that you're doing is you're bringing um, an intention into your conscious mind, if you like, you've, you're form formulating something you want to want happen. And then you're effectively destroying that conscious intention by forgetting about it. And you know that seems to me to be a fundamental part of the sigil process, but I'd never really thought about it in quite those terms before, you know. That you, you bring something to the forefront of your consciousness and then you forget about it or effectively destroy it. And yeah. maybe the, the whole, you know, 
creating a sigil and charging it and sending it off into the aether is is incidental to that process. I mean, I could be totally wrong, but you know that that's the way my mind works. I just get bizarre ideas, and sometimes they go somewhere, and sometimes they don't. You know, um, I got into a big argument on Twitter a few months ago because they were talking about the importance of magical intention. You know, you have to have a conscious intent to do magic, and I was going, I don't think that's true at all. And they were, well, can you explain that? I was like, no, no, it's just something I've thought of. You know, but. Why not question things, you know, rather than just taking them as read? Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm going off on a tangent here, I think, aren't I? Well, no, yeah, mind. yeah, but yeah, what you said about uh, sigils and all and stuff, I think that's exactly this. Yeah. And yeah. Oh, it just never struck me before in, in that way, you know. It took somebody else talking through the process for me to think, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I should go back to spare, actually, because I haven't read spare for donkey's years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I've been so, caught, caught up trying to read Deleuze and Guattari yeah. or, or Foucault or people like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so my oh. last question, yeah, yeah. It, uh, it has to do with uh, the queer thing and the minorities maybe, but uh, we know queer represents an important part of your life and work. Yeah. And I think it's never enough to talk about it in magic circles, which are supposed to be all about inclusion and diversity. We talked about this once. But this yeah. is not something you see in practice. So what's your relation with queer movement and what do you think about this, this contradiction? Um, I'm not sure there is a contradiction. I, it, a lot depends on, on how you think of the term queer. You know, is queer, I think we've talked about this before, is it just a, a, an umbrella term to encompass gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, intersex, yada, yada, yada? Or is, yeah. is queer a different identity? Yeah, uh, I, mean, I, I, mean I, contradiction, I mean contradiction in the sense of uh, a circle which is all about inclusion and diversity, but yeah. it doesn't work like that. Um, well, thinking about my, my own reaction to, if you like, homophobia or queerphobia in the occult, which I did experience quite a lot of, um, particularly when I started coming out as a queer occultist, um, that is one issue, and it's it's you know despite all the the people going on about inclusivity, inclusivity and oh the occult is queer friendly that's a lot of rubbish you know because yeah. I think it's probably got better um, in the sense that queer people who are occultists have got more vocal and more out and more you know ready to like tell people to shut their faces. Um, they become more stronger, if you like, uh, over the years, and I think that's a good thing. Um, I think the, there is a great deal of, uh, if you like, queer inflected occult work coming out of North America. I've seen some very good anthologies uh, of, you know, queer occult practitioners discussing their various practices and, and perspectives. Um, I, I think what would help enormously if we had more material coming out from the rest of the world, you know, from spaces which are not dominated by, if you like, North American views of, of what queer occultism could be. Um, you know, we, we need to hear from a, a wider range of people, if you like, in different cultures and from very different perspectives. I, I think that would be great. Um, as far as practices go, um, that I think is very, if you like, path dependent. Because take, for example, Tantra. Um, when I was first getting interested in Tantra, which was uh, the early 80s, there were a lot of people saying, oh, well, if, you, if you're queer, if you're gay, if you're a lesbian, you can't, be in, you can't do Tantra, which is completely rubbish. But, you know, it was a kind of article of faith in some circles. Um, and then when I started looking at actual classical Tantric material, um, this is not an issue. I mean, it's not even raised, you know, it's, it's just not, you know, it's not something that the text, the people writing the text are interested. In fact, you, you do get references to saying, oh, well, you know, uh, you could visualize, say that Arden Arishvara, who's a kind of like vertically split deity, is an instantiation of Shiva, he's half, half Shiva and half the goddess. You know, you can, you can hello, pussy. 
you can <laughs> you can worship Ard Narish Farmer as male, as female, or as third gender, or as no gender. Yeah. You know, the, the, and the, these strictures that people will come in out with saying, oh, well, you know, if, you, if you're into man sex or woman sex and you're whatever, you can't do Tantra. That's all Western overlay. It's, you know, there's nothing about it in the classical literature. And it doesn't actually really matter um, what your, your identity is to practice those rituals. Um, you know, but, you know, the, there are issues like in Wicca, Certainly when I was involved in Wicca, male-female polarity was a big thing. And I think it still is for some people. And the issue with that is that people take that to be a cosmic law. You know, there's men and there's women. And anything that, you know, anything that goes beyond that energy exchange polarity is somehow a really bad thing. Um, and that led a lot of people, myself included, to go, to question that, say, well, no, this isn't a cosmic law. It's just people, you know, having a kind of like a really um, patriarchal view of gender relations. And this again feeds into some of the stuff that I bring up, in, I think, in trajectories that we, you know, we treat a lot of things in the occult as though they were cosmic laws, you know, like there is a, as inviolable as two plus two equals four, when in fact they're actually just people's prejudices and opinions that have been, you know, given a boost. I mean, I've, 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 one of my favorite examples is, uh, I read this book on the Kabbalah that was written, I think, in the early 70s. And the author states, you know, boldly, homosexuality is a perversion and it's evil. It's just like taking drugs or worse, you know. And despite the modern apologetics for this thing, it's a perversion and it's evil. And it was like, this is a cosmic law. And I was like, Okay, at first I was very kind of like, oh, does that mean I can't be a magician just because I fancy men? And then I was kind of like, no, fuck it. You know, that's not a cosmic law. That's prejudice that's been elevated. So that's, you know, I think one good thing that's come out, if you like, of the, of the growing number of queer people involved in the occult is people wouldn't say, no, that's bollocks. You know, we don't have to take it as cosmic law. You know, we can, we can you know, find our own truths or, you know, Ex expose shit when it gets written and there is a lot of rubbish in in occult stuff you know and again that's an interesting thing how do you de determine what's you know valid for you and what you can reject yeah. and i i just said to people well I'll, I'll never take this idea that that you know um same sex love is is a, is an offense against the gods it's it's just not a universal truth for me sorry i think it's just rubbish you know um, but yeah, I would love to see more queer writing come out from different people uh, in different cultures. Um, and particularly more queer writing that was acceptance of, of diverse approaches, you know, not just a bunch of gay men uh, writing for everybody else, because that would be just as, as boring as having straight people writing for queer folk, you know. Uh, uh, I'd love to see more diversity of, of opinion and expression. Um, and if people like what I'm writing, then fair enough. And if they don't, tough. I'm going to keep doing it. Yes. <laughs> this is great. That there is space for er everyone. I have interviewed over 250 people from yeah. everything that you can imagine, from voodoo priests to Catholic exorcists, from mm -hmm. Telemites to Chaos Magic, and, and they, they, they share magic is universal and you have so many different points of view that yeah. it's insane to, to just focus in, in one thing at all. Mm. Well, we're getting to the end of the show. I have just one question that I have to ask you. I, I have asked it to, to all these 250 people and I'd like to know your personal opinion. That is, uh, after we die, what do you think happened? What do you think will happen to you? after you die? Um, I'll let you know, if I can. <laughs> do you believe o in anything? Otherwise, or otherwise don't worry I, about I, that? I have, no, I have no idea, you know. Uh, <laughs> if possible, I'll come on the show after I've died and let you know. 
All right. So, Phil, thank you so much. It was gold. It was wonderful. And, and thank you, Rogério, so much for building this bridge so we could interview him. And how can we support the, the crowdfunding? Uh, for, first of all, I'm the one who, say, who needs to say thank you. Thank you, Marcelo. Thank you, Phil Hein, for being with us again. And my pleasure. The, thank you so much. And oh, to buy great. the book. Yeah. <laughs> I was really nervous, but I'm, I'm happy now. I've got to have yeah. a big drink. Yeah. It was an amazing conversation. And, and to know the books and to, to support it and to buy them, you can go to catarsi.me barra Fuhein. And uh, we will be with this for sale or campaign, fundraising campaign until uh, January 19, I think. All uh, right. And uh, the links, all the links uh, will be down here. Just yeah. uh, check out. Yeah. So thank you, Phil, okay. so much. Thank okay. you, Rogério. Okay. And for you that stay with us in the show, do your like and press all the stuff from, from YouTube that I can't remember to say it in English, but see you next po podcast mayhem. <laughs>